Railways and Leeds have been a thing since the late 1700s. The Middleton Railways were already established and the movement of products by rail were becoming alluring, especially as the only other modes of transporting goods were canal and roads, and the canals especially were monopolising the transport market. In 1814, Leeds proposed a new railway line between it and the port of Selby. It also proposed using steam-hauled engines, something the Middleton Railway had done two years prior. The new line would be the same engines as the Middleton and would travel about three to four miles an hour, hauling 100 tonnes, equally spaced out in 10 ton wagons. Sadly, despite George Stevenson carrying out the survey and gathering support from local businesses, it failed to gather any local support and the plan was shelved owing to a lack of available funding. It seemed though that George Stevenson was not prepared to give up yet. As his survey for the Liverpool and Manchester Railway were going through Parliament, he prepared a second survey for Leeds. This time, instead of Selby, George had his sight set further to Hull. It was hoped that Leeds would be one link in a chain of railways that would link Liverpool to Hull via Manchester. The plan was more than Leeds could ever imagine. Not only would they be linked with Hull, but with Bradford, Rochdale, Manchester and Liverpool. It also meant that Uddersfield, Wakefield and Dewsbury would also be interconnected. Needless to say, the plan was approved and in 1825 the Leeds and Hull Railway Company were formed. Their rivals, Air and Calder Navigation Company, were clearly not too happy with the railways challenging their monopoly, but they still had control of the larger bulkier goods that the railway couldn't transport. Still, the navigational company didn't attempt to quell rumours that the railway would terrify the locals, especially children and women with delicate constitutions, or that the locomotives were simply not up to the task, travelling that distance and speed. Despite opposition, the railway pressed on and appointed George Stevenson as the engineer. He then recommended a double line all the way through from Leeds to Hull once Manchester had been connected. In the meantime, the navigational company, aware of the plans for the railway, rushed on a plan to create a new canal between Nottingley and Goole, which included improvements to Goole's dockside. Improvements that meant it was going to be taking traffic from Selby and Hull, and ultimately the railway when it arrived. Great railway race was on. In 1830, the line was given clearance by Parliament to start building, and it was estimated to cost approximately £200,000 to build. There would be six main stations and enough land was purchased to allow for four lines to be laid. There was also tunnels to consider, including the Marsh Lane Tunnel, and they called on the experience of William Shaw to oversee it. When completed, the tunnel was described as the best of its time and was single-handedly the line's most impressive feature. The new Marsh Lane station at Leeds would feature space for four trains, a large courtyard and offices for the superintendents and the clerk, and interestingly there was no platforms for the passengers, with the passengers having to use carriage steps to alight the carriages. A new goods depot was built to the south, allowing for trains to loop around the station to drop goods away from passengers, and this also included an engine shed and workshops, and a turntable and water and coal facilities. At the other end of the line at Selby, the station wasn't as grand as Leeds, but grand enough to make an impact. It had no platforms, but it served the passengers well. The line officially opened in 1834 with the first train leaving on a rather wet and soggy marsh lane at 6am with an expected arrival in Selby about 8 o'clock with the gentry and dignitaries all aboard in first class coaches. It didn't go exactly to plan as the engine started to slip on the wet rails. Much to the jeers and laughter of the onlookers, the poor train and its elite cargo had barely travelled 2 miles in 40 minutes. Luckily, the weather cleared up, drying the rails, and soon it started to pick up speed to a respectable 20 mile an hour, with the crowds lining the route now cheering at them rather than berating them. The train arrived three hours late and the dignitaries alighted to refreshments and beer. Refreshments they freely shared with the growing crowds. Within 10 minutes, the engine was turned and ready to head back, with carriages fit to burst in with impressed passengers. In all, once the passenger routes were opened, it was the norm to get from Leeds to Selby in little under 75 minutes. Leeds was finally connected to Hull with the completion of the Hull and Selby Railway in 1840, and ultimately toppling the navigational's grip on goods transportation. 
The speed that the freight could travel under the new rails was second to none and perishable goods could be moved a lot easier. 1840 though sparked another big milestone for Leeds. The railway king had arrived. George Hudson's York and North Midland Railway had reached Milford's junction on the 29th of May 1840 and was forced to use Leeds and Selby rails to get into Leeds. For George, this wasn't enough as the control of getting in and out of Leeds wasn't in his hands. The Leeds and Selby railway executives could deny how much he could pay or worse, deny him entry. The North Midlands saw the line as an opportunity and wanted in, but Leeds and Selby refused. Hudson though played his trump card and showed the Leeds and Selby line directors his plans to run to Hull with his own trains using his own lines to be a direct competitor. The directors agreed to a leasing arrangement of the Leeds and Selby line. Hudson did exactly what he wanted. He ran his own trains on the line, but they were only goods. He closed Marsh Lane Station and told the people of Leeds that the line was no longer accepting passengers along that route, only the routes he owned. He further sealed the deal by buying the railway three years later. In five years, Hudson Empire would come crashing down in spectacular scandal of overinflated shares and dodgy dealings. But for the people of Leeds, the new chairman, Harry Stephen Thompson, was a hero. He was a leader in the anti-Hudson inquiry. He hated the way that Hudson had acted, and one of the first steps was to reopen Marsh Lane and Selby to passengers, much to their relief. Joining Leeds to Manchester, though, was going to be just as rocky as Selby and Hull. George Stevenson and James Walker were appointed as joint engineers to the scheme and two routes were proposed. One was longer but easier to build while the other one was more direct and would involve some considerable engineering. The longer route was able to connect to various major towns and cities including Bradford, Huddersfield and Halifax and Oldham. It was also cheaper. Seeing the extra benefits outweighing the extra miles, George's longer route won out. Now that the route was approved, all it needed was to get through Parliament. The Air and Calder Navigational Company were not too happy that this new contender was on the scene and tried to create a stink in Parliament. But the line got through the first and second readings without incident. But on its final reading, it was thrown out, as the finances for the railway had not been proved. The railway appealed, but it failed, much to the canal owner's delight. The railway waited a further six years. In that time, financial climates had improved, and bolstering on the success of the Manchester and Liverpool Railway, it was granted royal assent to form a line between Oldham Road and Manchester to a junction at Normanton to connect with the North Midland. The Leeds and Manchester Railway was incorporated in 1836, and work was ready. But once again, this wasn't without opposition. This time, it was the landowners and even some of the towns that were reluctant to have a railway pass through them. The Fieldens in Tombardon were wealthy mill owners and had a lot of power and influence. The land the railway was going to use, belonging to them, was 300 yards long and only 50 foot wide. He only wanted £2,000 in return. That's only equivalent to £282,000 today. But he was dead serious and took the railway to court. The court did award the Fieldens compensation, but it only covered the land and buildings affected priced at the current market value, which was much less than what they anticipated. Others were not so lucky. A chap called Turner took the railway to court claiming he wanted £1,500 compensation for his stone quarry that would be massively affected by the railway. The court took a much more realistic view, awarded him £475 and ordered Turner to pay all the court costs. The Air and Calder Navigational Company was still causing trouble. They had goaded the town of Wakefield to openly oppose the railway coming to the town. The railway was in deeper water when they were handed an injunction over claims that they had breached their own act in crossing Kirkgate. The act advised that they should only cross using a viaduct. The Air and Calder Company said that this implied using one of the arches to span the street, but the railway insisted their right to build two piers on the street, forming a large opening for carriages and two smaller ones for each side for pedestrians. The whole mess was brought to a judge in London, who quickly then turned it back up to York to be overseen by a special jury. The matter was fought over so aggressively between the two companies that some of the townsfolk expected the partially constructed viaduct to be vandalised at some point. But the York jury sided with the railway. The Air and Calder were so sure of their success 
that it even booked and paid for a celebrity dinner. Their appetites truly spoiled, the railway directors took full advantage and ate the dinner, all while toasting to the loss of their hosts. The air and colder was down, but not out. They fought the Leeds and Manchester Railway every mile the railway gained. In 1839, the Manchester Railway had powers to divert the river nearer to Kirkthorpe. The railway had planned to cross using free bridges, but to reduce costs, a single free arch bridge was planned instead. The changes required rerouting of the Calder River, which was not in the original plans, and the air and Calder jumped on it at once, once again handing an injunction and stopping the work. After a settlement of £12,352 to the canal's interest so they can build a diversion, the railway could continue. Despite this, the railway erected a temporary bridge to the public and the canal networks called halt again, this time stating that the new bridge would interfere with their boat. In the end, it was ultimately found out that the proposed new cutting the river would take would be useless to the navigational company anyway, so they proposed their own route, completely bypassing the railway entirely. Yeah, I know. What a palaver. The first section of this new line was finally finally open to passengers on the 3rd of July 1839. This line stretched from Oldham to Littleborough, with four new locomotives pulling twin trains, and George Stevenson himself riding aloft in the guard seat on one of the trains. There was a slight mishap when one of the locomotives dropped its plug and had to stop, but the second time came to the rescue, and the strange cavalcade headed to Oldham with little further incident. Yet there were further sections that were open, and the completed railway was finally open in 1841. It took over 20 years to get there, but for the first time, there were running routes right across the half of Yorkshire and Manchester. The railway would eventually merge into the Lancaster and Yorkshire Railway, and big changes would be inevitable, but the main line would stand structurally unchanged and is still strong today. In fact, you can cross the full length on it in little under two and a half hours.